hear me. His cousin is American. Чем сила? А вы что, собираетесь на ней жениться? Да. Ух, красота-то какая. Лепота. Таможня дает добро. Я вообще не называю меня, пожалуйста, Вероника. Кто я? Вот кто я? Отныне русский земля единый быть. Hi, my name's Ali, and this is the Roos Files Unite podcast, where we watch Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I'm joined by a guest, and today my guest is Johnny Tickle. So, hi, Johnny. Thank you for coming on the show. Hello, my pleasure. My pleasure. I've been listening to you for a long time. Oh, that's that's great. That's always, that's always nice to hear. So, Johnny, uh, could you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm from England, as you can hear. I'm from a city called Preston. Actually, when I was born there, it was a town. It became a, a city during my lifetime. Uh, oh, I like don't... got the charter and all that. Yeah, 2002, it was the Queen's Jubilee. She uh, made one city in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, we were the lucky ones to become a city in uh, in England. 2002. Yeah, we should explain for non-UK listeners, we have this weird thing where to be officially a city, you have to have a charter from the monarch. And yes. where where I grew up and where I uh, live now again after my... Um, Your stint in uh, Russia, huh? My st- yes, which is now quite a long time ago. Uh, yeah. But after my st- yeah, stint, stint in Russia, I'm back, I'm back here. And it's kind of a little bit of a joke place in, in England, but it's called Milton Keynes. And it just asserts its citydom, even though it doesn't have the status. But we're just like, well, we're big enough to be a city, so we're just going to call ourselves a city and whatever. But it's so weird when you think about it from like a non British perspective. I mean, right. like, Rus- from a Russian perspective, it's even, it's like strange, it's just all the same to them. Yeah, because a Gorod is yeah. a town or a city, and I don't know what size you have to be to count as a Gorod, but it's not it's even not a that... It's not a because it's not a village, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's not even that big, yeah. So, yeah. like... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of rid- ridiculous, but but yeah. but anyway, yeah, yeah. So mine's called Preston, anyway. Yes, which I'll just mention it mention in, in passing. That's um, I, I used to pass through there on the train huh? a, a number of times a year because I went to I went to Lancaster uh, right. University. So uh, whereas you went to to university in in London, you went to yes, UCL. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So we kind of did the opposite thing. So uh, non UK listeners, I should also also if you have acute ears, you may be able to tell that I'm from. Southern England and yes, John is Northern, from, yeah. from the north. Yeah, kind of difference in vowels. But yeah, I, I'm a Southerner who went north for uni and uh, and you're a Northerner who went south. But but yeah. anyway, um, yeah, I totally interrupted you when you were explaining. Yeah, yeah, were. so I'm from Preston. I, I don't have like a particularly long story about my introduction to Russia like some of your previous guests, you know. Uh, like Michelle Birdie, for example, I, hers was, she talked forever about her long story in Russia because she's been here for so long. But I've only mm. been here for, uh, well, two and a half years, um, three years cumulatively because uh, I studied Russian in university. Mm. Uh, I did a year abroad in St. Petersburg, which like co- coincidentally is one of the characters in the movie we're talking about. And um, ever since I graduated from university in London, I've been living and working here. In Moscow. Awesome. Um, so you did uh, a languages degree and you also did German as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I did a half a year in Hamburg and half a year in St. Petersburg. Mm. So that was going to be one of my questions. Uh, yeah. Was So having, I'm assuming at school you would have studied German and carried that on at university? Or yeah, were yeah. You... Uh, right. That's right. Yeah, I did German mm. at A-level and I started Russian from nothing in university. Gotcha. Because that, that's one of those things like 
there are some places where you can learn Russian at school, but it's it's generally the kind of exception rather than the rule. It's typically you you do Spanish, French, or German are, are kind yeah. of the the options. But uh, what made you decide to pick Russian as a, as an additional language? That's that's a good question. Um, I always wanted to learn a second language because I, I was I finished my A levels like really good at German, far better mm. than the rest of my class. So I thought this. University is going to be a breeze. Why don't I pick up a second language? Mm. So I was I thought through them, and I thought about Spanish. But lots of English people speak Spanish. And I thought, well, Russia is a country I've always been interested in, mainly mm. through history, but also through literature, but really mainly history. Mm. And um, I chose it over Spanish. It was between those two. And, gotcha. it, and basically what turned out was I, what I thought was going to be a very easy degree, because I was essentially fluent in German, mm. became an incredibly hard degree because I picked up Russian. <laughs> yes, yeah, so some rather different uh, consonant clusters going right, on uh, right, to, yeah. to kind of uh, wrap your teeth and tongue and lips around. Yeah, I feel like that's one of those things that people always say, oh, isn't learning to read the Cyrillic alphabet the hard thing? And it's kind of like, ah... Uh, no, that's, that's, that's less than no. one, isn't it? Yeah, you, it's a couple, it's you a couple get days. There. I mean, it, it's funny. I did a taster lesson of mm-hmm. Russian at some kind of like Northamptonshire languages day, like okay. when I was about fifteen, and they did, and we did Russian, and and that was the impression I got from that was just like, oh, just learning a different alphabet is so hard. And it's like, mm, it's not. I mean, like tiny kids learn. Learn the Latin alphabet if if they grow up in in the UK. So it's yeah. you know it's it's not that hard. You're just memorizing some uh, some symbols, and a lot of them are the same. So, but yeah, yeah, so, that was so the easy was, bit. Yeah, <laughs> so it was a bit of a bit of a shock to the system. Yeah, because I I, did, I also did French at um I did it French up the GCSE. I ended up gotcha. choosing German over French because because I liked mm. it more. Um, uh, okay. And I wanted to, I didn't want to, I didn't envision myself going into languages, so I just threw away mm. French so I could do a bit more of a broader range of, of subjects. Mm, I, I did the same, but with French instead instead of German. And okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I, I really struggled at A-level French and just, uh, I, I just uh, kicked it to the curb after the first year. <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah, it happens to some people. You've either got it or you haven't. Or... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because I really enjoyed it. I just wasn't doing as well in my other subjects and my rationale was like well the time i'm putting into this is going to drag me down in the other subjects but right, yeah. yeah you know the wisdom of a what like 16 slash 17 year old right uh, uh... anyway sorry hijacking your your side of the story again no go for it so basically since i've been here in uh moscow well it's two and a half years now and i've had a few jobs i keep myself busy but at the moment, the main way that people know me is from YouTube. Uh, so if someone recognised my name in the title of this podcast, it's got to be because of my YouTube. Which started off as me wanting to show foreigners that Russia is not weird or alien. And has basically ended up as a way to fund me travelling all over the country. Yes, I was going to say, uh, you, you've you travelled quite extensively within, uh, within Russia. Um... So yeah, I just wanted to go back a little bit and and say like what what was it that kind of having done six months in one place and six months in the other made you settle on on Russia? Well, it, it turned out that I um, I enjoyed both equally, essentially. But living in Germany, it wasn't really a challenge. Uh, mm. My German was excellent. Germany is not that different to England. In fact, it's basically the same. It's the same if transport works properly, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, that was kind of my experience of, of visiting Stuttgart uh, for a few days, like about 10 years ago. It's kind of like, wouldn't it be nice if stuff worked this well in the UK? <laughs> right. So, in fact, in fact, Germany is just a very easy place to live in. There was no mm. challenge for me. And while being in, say, Petersburg, I enjoyed it a lot. But it was it was by no means easy. I, I wouldn't say I didn't have culture shock or anything like that. It was just a very different experience living in either Germany or in the UK. And I mm. sort of um, fell in love with it, really. Um, with Russia, with St. Petersburg. And uh, it made me like sort of determined to come back. When I came back mm. to the UK after being in St. Petersburg, I said to myself, once I finish university, once I graduate, I'm coming 
on the next plane and I'm flying straight back to Russia and I'm going to find any job I can find. Gotcha. Was there also an element with the language, with being as comfortable as you were with with German that you kind of like thought, well, I've made it this far with Russian. I want to push on with it till I get to that level uh, with that too kind of thing? Or Yeah, yeah, there was. And the funny thing is now my Russian is excellent and my German has mm. de- declined because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just don't use it at all. I haven't used it at all sure. for about two years, apart from when visiting Germany and Austria. And uh, it's hit hit me very quickly that I've basically forgotten every, not not everything. That's a stretch, but like it takes me some time to get back into it. You know? Yeah, everything kind of like shoves into the kind of passive part of your brain, so you yeah. can understand it when people are speaking to you or or when you're reading something. But like actually trying to speak is <laughs> is really tough. I find that. I mean, yeah. my Russian was never amazing. It was just starting to get reasonably good when I left. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, now it's kind of like, oh, I can, I can watch a film. It's nice to have subtitles just to kind of make sure I don't miss things. But yeah, trying to have a conversation now is kind of back to like pulling teeth. It's <laughs> it's very sure, sad. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so um, I did say before I jumped the conversation back, uh-huh. you've travelled quite extensively with within Russia, which is awesome, getting to see a bit more of the place. So, uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to ask what what have been your highlights in terms of places you've visited? Because you've done like a top five on, on Twitter and yes. maybe the top two won't surprise anybody. But yeah, the, further down the list, it's kind of like, huh. Yeah, well, I've been to lo- lots of places and the... Um... The caveat I'd like to give is that some I spent more time, some I spent less time. Of course. Some, t- some I went in the summer mm. when it was beautiful and 30 degrees. Other times I was there in the winter when it was minus 20. So my um, my by myself, ranking of cities, it's more about, not really about the city, but more of my experience there. Which is, of course, linked to the city, but also the stuff I did there, the weather, mm. etc. Yeah, um, that is that is a good caveat because I noticed that you didn't particularly rate your experience of Nizhny Novgorod, and that was a place that I did manage to get to. Uh-huh. And I went in November, and it was really cold, but it was beautifully sunny practically the whole time we were there, and so it just meant all the views were beautiful. We could walk around, and it wasn't miserable because it was nice and sunny. And yeah, just had quite a pleasant experience overall. But yeah, you said that uh-huh. you had like well, lousy weather both day, both times. Well, actually, if I talk about um, Nizhny Novgorod, the first time mm. I went there was actually in the summer, and it was during oh, the okay. World Cup. And it was during the World Cup. Ah, right. Yes, and that was that was incredible. But I don't know. I don't think it was necessarily because of the city. It's because of mm. the weather. Sure. All the international people there, the excess drinking, watching football. It's a great time overall. <laughs> and then um, after that, I thought, well, I went to Nizhny Novgorod, but I didn't actually see anything apart from the inside mm. of football stadium and a few, sure. and a few bar, bars and pubs. So I thought, it's time to go back and see the sights. And I went back and it was in um, either January or February. And it oh. was freezing cold. <laughs> it was very snowy. But, mm. you know, I try, and, I try and remove that from the equation. I try and y- look my You kind of have to if you're, tra- if you're traveling around right. Russia in the winter. <laughs> yeah. And like, uh, if we speak specifically about Nizhny Novgorod, I thought the main street was very nice. The Kremlin is okay, apart from the like awful 70s building, like office building, which is right in the middle of a very old Kremlin, which is very strange. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but once you got away from the main street, there was like lots of things falling down. I remember seeing um, an apartment complex being built. Mm. And I was there in, I think it was January 2019. And there was a sign saying, estimated completion date, second quarter 2018. I was like, that's six months ago. You know? <laughs> but, uh, there's, yeah, there's, um, no, I, I, don't, I didn't hate it. It's definitely mm. not in my bottom five. It's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yes, well... <laughs> I, I kind of wonder sometimes whether Chelyabinsk is kind of like the Russian equivalent of Milton Keynes, that it's just like a place that everyone else likes to make a joke about. Well, Chelyabinsk is definitely the worst place in Russia that I've been to. <laughs> Didn't like the local news in uh, Chelyabinsk pick up that you were the Englishman who hates Chelyabinsk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been quoted a few times in the newspaper. 
But there was a funny <laughs> thing. Um, what happened is they posted, uh, Englishman comes to Chelyabin's, hates mm. it, whatever. And lots of the comments were like, oh yeah, he's right, it's awful. Okay. <laughs> and lots of like locals. So then they added a poll in like another article. Like, do you agree with him? Do you disagree with him? And the residents of Chelyabinsk overwhelmingly agreed with me that it was terrible. <laughs> something like 80%. So it was like all, almost like a... And there's something like 2 or 3%, oh, it's the best city in Russia. A few of them, mm. it's all right. And like 80%, yeah, it's terrible. It's completely right. <laughs> that just strikes me as like quite a... I was going to say that's quite a Russian thing to do, but I can imagine places in the UK doing that as well. Um. I mean, I think being self-depreciating is sort of an international thing. But the thing, yeah. with, the thing with Russian cities, a lot of them have uh, rivalries against another city. Mm. So you can say to people from Moscow, I don't like Moscow, but they'll say to you, yeah, but would you like it more than St. Petersburg? I was going to say, like, do your St. Petersburg friends think of you as a bit of a turncoat having <laughs> having moved to Moscow now? Uh, but you know what? I, I do love St. Petersburg. <laughs> it is my number two city. Mm. But it's, um, for me, uh, it's too small. Gotcha. Moscow is constantly changing. You can mm. go to, you cannot go to an area of, a, area of the city for two or three months and you'll, you'll come back and it's completely different. There's a, a new exhibition, there's a new restaurant, something you went to is closed, it's mm. been replaced by something. Whereas in St. Petersburg, that it happens, but nowhere near as fast of a rate. It's not gotcha. growing as fast. The ways that it's growing are just um, apartment buildings, basically, on the outskirts of the city. Yeah, just kind of more residential type. Yeah. And the problem with St. Petersburg, um, people there call it a big village. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'd heard that somewhere. Yes. It's, it, it's spot on. Like, um, I've been... When I was there for like, one semester when I was studying there. Mm. And after, like, in the second month, I'd be walking down Nevsky Prospect and I would see people I know. <laughs> oh, I, know, I met you in this bar, or this club, or we were in this class together, or we, and like all sorts of different places that I'd seen mm. people. Whereas in Moscow, I could walk around for all day, everywhere, mm. and there's not a chance I would see anyone I know. And if I do, it's a yeah. big shock. Yeah, it. I remember the the couple of times that I randomly bumped into people in Moscow, and it probably happened like a handful of times in the five years I was there. And it was always a surprise. I mean, yeah, there were a couple of instances where it was like super surprising because I didn't, you know, this was a Russian that I didn't even, I had met not in Russia. So (laughs) so that was super surprising. But yeah, yeah, it was very, it was a very rare occurrence. It almost feels like when I go back home to the UK and uh, just like Christmas or something, Mm. and I see somebody I know from school on the street, I like hide around the corner. So... They don't see me kind of thing. In Moscow, not a, not, not a problem. Not a problem. No, There's no chance. Anonymity. Yeah, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like London in that way. Actually, that's. Uh, I'm glad you brought London up because I was going to say, you've lived in two capitals for, you know, a good amount of time now. Uh-huh, how, yeah. how would you compare the two places? Well, I'm, I much prefer Moscow. But I understand that my reasons are quite personal. And sure. to be honest, probably like socioeconomic. Um, mm. In London, I was a student, student loan, counting every pound, you know, yeah. can I afford this, can I afford that? Yeah, and dealing Moscow, with London prices. <laughs> yeah. And Russians all say that Moscow is a very expensive city. Mm. And in comparison to the rest of Russia, it is. But compared to London, it's like a, yeah. it's so cheap here mm. that um, I'm in a situation with, because of full-time work, mm. I don't have to think about what I'm buying. Uh, yeah. I can go out and not think about it. And that mm. means I have the, like a sort of flexibility here that I don't have in the UK. And sure. also, if I think of my friends who are still in the UK, lots of them have great jobs, maybe they're in banking, earning a lot of money, um, they still have to count the pennies, you know? They, if they don't want to live in some sort of student slum, uh, like, yeah. where I used to, like where I used to live when I was like really like in university, mm. at, the end of the, at the end of the year, they've had one holiday, they've spent all their money. Whereas in Moscow, it's completely different. So that's probably, I'm aware that that's like 75% of it. Um, yeah, and, and about about Moscow, it also, I don't know as recently, but it was always, you know, getting rated as being an extremely expensive city for expats. And part of that was just like, if you're having a kind of very like... I don't know. Expat lifestyle. Exec- I mean. Exactly, kind of executive level lifestyle. If you're if you kind of learn to shop where 
Where the Russian people shop. Locals, shot. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Spot Your on. Your money goes, goes a lot further. And, and being an English language teacher, that's definitely what what I had to do. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And then it just kind of seemed like, I mean, certainly, I don't know what it's like now, but rent compared to London was, you know, much more reasonable. Right, yeah. Yeah, you're spot on. And the thing is here, a lot of the expat community, who I tend to avoid, like, as much as possible... Um, <laughs> A lot of them don't speak Russian, mm. um, so they have trouble in that way, which causes them to spend extra money in other other situations. Right, 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 and right. As, like you meet ex- expats in a pub who have been here for ten plus years and don't really speak that much Russian, um, mm. and I think how do you, how do you survive? But it's that sort of lifestyle which causes them to spend more than they need to. Whereas if you yeah. can live like a Russian, um, you can speak Russian. Maybe you have Russian friends. It's uh, a lot. It's a lot different. And yeah. But I always talk, hear people comparing London and Moscow, and I think if you take out the 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 money, the socioeconomic part of it, they're very similar. Like mm. um, great nightlife, um, great opportunities for travel. Like Moscow's got three airports, London's got loads of airports. Um, like there's all these different things. Uh, the public transport here is great, a lot cheaper in London. Public transport's mm. very good in London, but very expensive. Um, yeah. Oh, and and the Moscow Metro has absolutely ruined the tube for me. Uh-huh. Yeah, so there's Moscow and London aren't that different, really. Mm, yeah, you even said in one of your videos that there was quite a similarity in that just how important the Russian capital is to Russia and ha- and how important London is to the UK, and it's kind of different from say Germany or the US, where things right. are a little bit more kind of decentralized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything's here. Um, and like in the UK, everything's in in London, yeah. And that means that both of those cities, they draw in um, the talent, they draw in mm. people with ambition, um, they draw in the people who can actually economically afford to go there. Like there's lots of incredibly talented people in Russia who don't live in Moscow, either by choice or just the fact that they can't afford it. Mm. So there's all sorts of different... I mean, it's the same in London, right? Um, oh, yeah. And there's there's something also about the size which which often, like, puts people off. Like, mm-hmm. I certainly, like... I went to university and where I went to university because I wanted somewhere that was a bit ma- more manageable. And it was only after I'd lived in a relatively small capital when I was an exchange student that I was kind of like, oh... Actually, I I could handle something bigger, so that's how I ultimately did end up, you know, braving yeah. Moscow, which was a, a big jump for me. But uh, yeah, it is interesting that, that that there is kind of like a, a bit of a mentality about like whether you think that you will like living somewhere that big. Yeah, and uh, I think um, for anyone who's listening to this who has never lived in Russia or is thinking about it, then there's a whole range of cities which I could recommend to people mm. to go and live in. So if you don't want to live in a big city, the idea of a city with God knows how many people, some people say up to 20 million people in Moscow, mm. accounting for all the unregistered people. Oh, yes, like yeah. Um, if, you, if that number frightens you, then St. Petersburg is a great option, mm. as are many other cities throughout the country, just, just not Chelyabinsk. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd say, I mean, haven't been there for a whole, you know, has only been there for a, a a couple of days, but I can imagine Nizhny being like quite manageable. Oh, um, manage- manageable for sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, but you have to bear well, in mind the English level is going to be lower there, and everything. That's there. that's the other thing. Like Moscow. Well, as as you were talking about it with with people who have lived there for ten years, and you can get by with very little Russian. So if you have no inclination to to learn the language, you can get away with it. But also, if you really want to learn Russian, then Moscow might not be the best place in terms of making sure you have lots of opportunities to practice. Because I found I had to get really quite good before people would even put up with me trying <laughs> to communicate with them. Like, even once my Russian was, like, demonstrably quite a lot better than their English their mentality was like, your Russian can't be better than my English because that's impossible. So I'm going to speak my really, really, really bad English rather than tolerate your pretty bad Russian. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, but, I've come yeah. across that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, okay, I, I'm glad it's not just me. Um, mm. But yes, so um, we're you know obviously nominally a film podcast. So uh, you say that every time, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so I did. I did notice in just looking over our kind of preliminary chats that you'd you'd actually done a a module on russian cinema in university so yeah what what films did you did you cover when you were doing that well it was uh i think maybe 10 films um some something in that eight to ten film range uh there were a huge uh range of different films and i couldn't possibly remember remember them all now sure but um what it really did that module was introduce me to a bunch of directors some who i Mm. liked and some who i didn't but uh in particular i remember um introduced me to zvagintsev for example Mm. um we watched the movie elena have you seen it i have yes not for a few years but uh yes of course, that led me down to watching Leviathan and then Loveless, the most recent one. And um, we also uh, watched The Fool. Have you seen The Fool by Yuri Bikov? Uh, no, but uh, a previous guest, Martin Kessler, he has strongly recommended that one to me. So it's, it's very much on the list. Yeah, it's a great movie. Durak, it's called. And there's also uh, Bikov's movie. I, it sort of led me into his sort of work, mm. like Mayor. Uh, the the major, um, which is a great movie, and he also made a TV series called The Method, which I found mm. through. Um, it's actually on Netflix if anyone's interested. Which I oh, found, cool. which I found through uh, his m- movies. And then uh, I'm trying to think what else you watch. Um, Cargo Two Hundred, Gross de Vesti. You've seen that? Oh right? no, I haven't. I've not seen that much Balabanov. Um, okay, I'm, well, I've, must... I've heard I've heard that one is particularly like grim. Um, Particularly grim, yeah. I've I've kind of heard people say he's. I mean, he's he's not around anymore, but uh, uh-huh. he, he he was a bit of a kind of like Russian Tarantino in terms of levels levels of, of kind of like grim and unpleasant stuff you can expect. Uh, sure, but but really great movie. Um, mm. Like uh, it's not something you'd watch with family or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> But in terms of like the actual film, it's great. Mm. Uh, I think we we also watched um, Popogrebsky. He has a movie called Cocktail Bell, Roads to Cocktail Bell. Have you seen that movie? I have not seen that yet, but I, I we watched How I Ended This Summer. So, yes, I've yes, seen that as well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I enjoyed a lot. So uh, this is a problem, actually, with, with doing this podcast, is that if I haven't seen something, there's a tendency to go like, Oh, save it for the podcast. So right. <laughs> I, I'm not actually getting through my Russian films at perhaps the rate that I might do, which sounds really counterintuitive, which actually brings me on to the film we're going to be talking about today, mm-hmm. because this one I've known about for, this is probably like, with the exception of Tarkovsky and Eisenstein, this was probably one of the first Russian films I heard of, actually, because it was, it was made of quite a big deal of when it came out because of its central gimmick. And if you don't know which one I'm talking about, it's Russian Ark from 2002. And the central, well, maybe it's a gimmick or maybe it's, you know, just an artistic decision, but is that it's all one shot. Um, so presumably, was this was this one on your course as well? or No, it wasn't. But it, funnily enough, I ah. actually watched this movie for a different course. Um, mm. We actually read the, um, I can't remember what the course was exactly, but we read the book by um, Marquis de Castan, the main character in the movie. We read his, uh, I think mm. it was called Rush, something to, I can't remember the title now, but I read the book. And then mm. this was like a side thing of the, um, and part of this module in university. So I had actually sort of semi-studied it before. Because mm. he was like a French traveller who visited Moscow in the 19th century, right? Yeah, he, he, um, he visited St. Petersburg. Right, yes. <laughs> yes, so he maybe didn't see a wider picture well, of the country. Well, he was. there's absolutely no way he saw a wide picture of the country at all. It was all, um, it was mm. looking, it was in the in the court, you know. It, um, it was more about seeing what was going on with the Tsar rather mm. than uh, the average people. There's no way, there's no gotcha. way he saw um, a wide range of the country, not at all. He saw it far, no. far, far less than I have. <laughs> 
that's for sure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something which, you know, as many listeners will be aware of, that prior to the, the revolution, and, it, and even afterwards to, to an extent, there was there was kind of like talk of there being kind of two Russias. There's the kind of like the elite level folks who are, you know, well connected and high up in the government and, you know, pre-revolutionary times are noble. And then there's the vast majority of the population. Well, um, some people might say uh, nowadays isn't that different. Well, well, quite possibly. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's that's what we're, we're going to be watching. And so, as you say, it's a rewatch for, for you. So uh, uh, obviously you didn't totally hate it. Otherwise, <laughs> you wouldn't have agreed to watch it with us. But uh, no, I didn't yeah. totally hate it, but um, I have some very strong opinions. <laughs> Great. Good. Uh, but um, yeah, I thought it might be worth, as it's kind of topical, talking about the uh, the whole one take yeah. thing. Because, um, so, uh, well, uh, obviously it didn't win the the oscar but it did you know very good business this this year we have uh 1917 which isn't actually one take but it's that that's the effect so uh yeah have you managed to see that yes, one? yes i have i have how did you get on with it well i liked it I, I liked it a lot it was one of one of my favorites out of the oscar lots and i've seen i think almost all mm. of them and ob- obviously there's the similarity here with the one shot but 1917 has that mm fake one shot it's more seven yeah. to eight minute clips that are cut together to make it seem like one long shot mm. right that's my understanding yeah 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 whereas this is the real deal and it was done back in it was filmed on, on the 23rd of december 2001 okay right that answers that mm-hmm. question then so yeah it was like a digital camera and obviously you know Digital cameras have come a long way since then. So, uh, you know, you could now be, you know, for example, a YouTuber now, whereas back then, you know, having a digital camera that could shoot like a 90 minute film, you kind of had to pay quite a lot of money, I would have thought. Yeah, and actually, um, that was almost the first time that could have been done. It was the first, we talked mm. about the gap from now until then, but that was the first time they could really have a camera to film 90 minutes to film a full movie without having to change batteries and all of this. So that's really why people yeah. watch it, right? That does seem to be like its big talking point. So I'm having not seen it yet. I'm I'm wondering how... Because I, I actually saw 1917 mm-hmm. twice and the first time I was... Partly because I knew, well, I knew I knew ahead of time. I was super aware of the one shot esque thing, but the second time, I didn't notice it at mm-hmm. all. I just I was concentrating on other things, so it felt immersive, but I wasn't thinking about it. So I'll be curious to see, to see whether it's just like the the you know the unbroken take just you know feels like it's bashing me over the face yeah. you have know? you um seen any more one take films uh i don't think i have um i'm trying to think of I've, i'm trying to think of examples birdman no i haven't got round to that yet um, birdman is like a, another fake single shot film sure um, and there's also another one called rope which i've i've never seen i was gonna say yeah i've not seen it but i've heard that Actually, Hitchcock, he really wanted to do it to see if see if he could uh-huh. do it, but wasn't super satisfied with his results. And it's it's meant to be like, you know, a decent film because it's Hitchcock, mm-hmm. but like one of his lesser ones all the same. And some of it just seems a bit like you're making decisions to do the one take thing rather than because it particularly serves the story. So I'm interested in, in, in terms of that because, you know, obviously so much of how you normally convey things in film um, is about what you're, uh, how you're juxtaposing different images through cuts. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's very basic film theory stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I, I only know of one other film which is filmed actually as a unbroken single shot, and it's a mm. film called Victoria. Have you heard of it? I believe it's a German movie. Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, I've no. never seen it, but it's the only one I'm actually aware of. And um, hmm. it's interesting, before you talked about it, it being a gimmick, right? Well, that's, yeah, possibly the <laughs> the less generous way of describing no, it. No, but, but I understand yeah. why you're saying it, because that's 
originally what got people through the door to like watch the movie mm. and the reason why you're looking forward to to watch it is it's less the story i imagine and more the one shot seeing how it's done right yeah that's kind of like the kind of mental hook but i am interested i mean i know that they i think i know that they condense like 250 slash 300 years and it's all in the winter palace which i've I've been uh -huh. to. It was, admittedly, it was a very long time ago, but um, yeah. So I'm kind of interested to see just that as like a unbroken shot as well. Um, well, in my opinion, I've seen it before, but I don't think it's a gimmick. I think for this movie, without the single shot, it would, cause couldn't exist. So I'd be interesting to mm. interested to hear, hear your opinion in a few days. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So. What we say before we launch into the film every time is Payekhali. And uh, why do we say that, Johnny? It means let's go. Awesome. So, three, two, one. Payekhali. Payekhali. Back, Johnny and I have just watched Ruski Kavchek, that is Russian Ark, directed by Alexander Sakurov. And before we talk about what we thought about it, we're just going to have a quick summary of what took place or what was on screen from from Johnny. So uh, we can't really talk of a plot, but we'll probably get onto that later. Still, there's a lot to be said for not knowing what you're expecting uh, when you go to watch this film. So consider this a spoiler warning. We will we'll obviously be saying what what occurs. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, over to you, Johnny. Well, I'd sort of describe it as um, maybe a walk through Russian history. So you start off, you're following this guy, this guy who is known as the European in the movie. He is a diplomat, French diplomat, as we know from history. And we follow him around the Winter Palace as we see all these beautiful rooms. We see the, the way the Hermitage Museum is today. But in each room, there is like a different historical character from Russian history. And it's really hard to call it a plot as such, right? It's like hard yeah. to give, sort of give a plot it's, summary. It, is there a plot? Not really. It's kind of like... Like you say, it's you're just kind of wandering through this, as you say, now museum, formerly the Romanov Palace, and just encountering various scenes. And yeah, you, you have for company a lot of the time uh, this guy. So I looked it up. It was he in the credits. He's just the stranger, mm -hmm. but our narrator kind of, uh, as you say, describes him as the, as the European. But apparently, this guy. Is, is meant to be or is loosely based on Adolphe de Custine, who was yes. a French aristocrat who came to Russia in 1839 and supposedly said, yeah, Russia doesn't really have a national identity of its own. Uh, what did you think of him as a, uh, as a character and as a kind of travelling companion through this museum? Well, from what I know about the way the movie was made, mm. he... He was just told to walk through and dance around and be flamboyant. And it's sort of a weird feeling because you don't feel like you're walking with him. You're observing him. Mm. Because there's really two characters in the movie that, that are constantly with you, right? There's, yeah. there's him, the, the European, as he's referred to, and then the guy behind the camera, who is actually the director himself, right? I think I think it is the voice of the director, yeah. Yes. Um, and... And, and yeah, the, I th I thought the voice effect was was really kind of kind of odd because obviously you've got the the European or the stranger talking and the acoustics are very much the acoustics of whichever room you happen to be in, so it's quite kind of echoey and and reverby. Whereas mm. this kind of like narrator voice 
is much more kind of like muttery and under sort of almost under its breath and it kind yeah. of sounds a little bit kind of like mumbling it's like is this an internal monologue but clearly some of the time or quite a lot of the time the stranger can hear you so it's like a semi conversation but kind of like that sort of breaks off and when he wanders away it's kind of like this narrator is talking to himself so yeah it's it's odd it's kind of like the most highbrow first person video game that was ever created you know because it's all in that kind of first person like unbroken yeah it's just you're kind of like wandering around i think one thing we we should talk about you mentioned in the in the summary was that we encounter figures from russian history you should probably point out that it's not a massive slice of, of of russian history like the earliest we're we're talking about is kind of three-ish hundred years um, yes, back. Yeah. So, yeah, who do we bump into first? Um, first, I believe, is it uh, Alexander the First, the Emperor? Is the first one? Maybe. I, I, the first one I really remember uh, was seeing Peter the Great. We oh, see yes, him... he's, he's, like, harassing, like, uh, some... Um, like army guys, right? Like yeah, some... yeah, yeah, yeah. We see him through a window, except the window I thought was probably like CGI'd in, like it was kind of like this this bar, but it looked sort of like it was there, but sort of like lacking some weight. It was kind of, kind of odd, but it was like these kind of bars. From what I know about the the movie, I don't think it was CGI. I just think mm. it was sort of um, maybe touched up, recolored in in mm. post, and it was actually filmed within this whole one shot yeah thing and then i think after peter the great it's it sort of moves uh, through various different scenes with catherine the great nicholas the first uh, mm. nicholas the second and then all the way through to world war Two, and then nowadays right like uh, the modern day yeah like we briefly see a rather enigmatic conversation that seems to be people in the museum management and maybe like a politician and it's quite a fraught conversation um Mm -hmm. but it's i kind of don't really remember what it was about other than it was they were clearly having a bit of a, a a hard time um yeah so going back to nicholas the second i wanted to mention that it comes more or less towards the end and i found that like really kind of like doom laden because you know we all know what happens to what happens to, to him, him and yeah. his family and it it just feels oddly like not watching actors doing a performance it feels much more like you know you're you've literally gone back in a time machine because the guy that they got looks so like nicholas the second in his photographs that is mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the music they use is is very kind of like doom laden, I guess. Um, yeah, well, well, the interesting thing is we see when we see Nicholas II and his, his children, mm. you can see they have quite a, a good life, right? Um, there's no like it, it seems like they've got the kids have quite a I don't mm. know, idyllic life, and but and then when you know Russian history and you know what's coming, you know revolutions coming, mm. you know about their death is coming. I think the background knowledge of Russian history is what gives you that sort of doom, you said doom laden, right? Mm. That, yeah, I found that really interesting was the fact that you can tell from the titles of the film, which are mostly in the Latin al- alphabet, and and it, it's, it starts off with, in English, Russian arc. So clearly... It's being made with an international audience in mind. But I thought, I found it kind of bewildering anyway. And I know, you know, a fairly decent amount of uh, of Russian history for a Westerner. And I think if I didn't know very much at all, it would just be kind of like really hard to comprehend at all. I don't know. I don't know what you thought. Yeah, I think I think that could be true, but I, th- the, I think the reason that people who are not necessarily into Russian history are watching this movie is not because of necessarily the history, but because of the the no cut thing. Mm. I think the um, the history sort of there's something that would run through it. Whereas 
uh, me, for example, someone who's interested in Russian history, but also in filmmaking, I'm concentrating on both those things. Yeah, so um, you've seen the film before, but uh, yeah, what was your experience of the one cut this time? Because just going back to, we mentioned in the in the first half, 1917, and the second time I saw it, I kind of stopped seeing the fact that it was all one cut, and I just found it super immersive, whereas the first time I was incredibly aware of that. Did you have a similar experience watching this, or were you still super aware that the camera never, like, blinks, as it were? Well, you know, from what when watching this, because this is not my first time watching, mm. I wanted to focus on it a little bit more, because mm. I knew it would come up. And I came to the conclusion that this movie just would not work with cuts. Mm. Yeah, I briefly watched the trailer for it and obviously you can't make a trailer for this film well you could just take a like a two minute a segment and just go hey this is a two minute segment want some more of this come and see the film but no it was m much more conventional and it just felt weird and a lot less special i i guess i would say i i actually watched yeah. it in two sittings and i felt terrible for doing that i felt like it was kind of some weird act of disrespect but mm -hmm. you know it just that was the way you know my uh my evening worked so um well, oh yeah the, the funny thing about the the way the camera is floating because you know it's using a steady cam mm. which is very steady, but it's also like handheld, right? So I think um, so. It's yeah. not. It's not completely steady, and I sort of felt like when you combine it with the sort of droney, constant background music, and then like the floating around, it sort of felt to me like a ghost story. Do, mm. do you know where I'm coming from? Oh, absolutely. And there's bits where they even allude to that, where sometimes it's clear that the people present can see you and and other times it seems like they're not aware at all like and then there's some bits where you're trying to get in places and <laughs> and the people there are interacting with you and saying no no go away and then other times they're like totally oblivious but yeah i totally get that idea of like you're some kind of like ghost or invisible person just kind of like mm -hmm. um, yeah and then I think when you consider the fact that you sort of feel, when you're watching the movie, you kind of feel like you're a character in like sort of your ghost floating around. And then when you add it in with the the European, the stranger, and then you add in the director speaking, and then sort of everything around, it's sort of like all intermingled, intertwined. It's a very strange feeling, I think, mm. once you're aware of it. Yeah, definitely like, reviews i've seen of this use words like dreamlike or you know kind of mysterious or fantastical and i definitely get where where that's coming from um this is kind of jumping from one subject to another a bit go, but go for it. it is it is super interesting that there is a quite a lot in the movie about juxtaposing the european with the Russian. Now, for many listeners, I think especially uh, perhaps listeners on the other side of the pond will be kind of a little bit surprised because they'll, they'll be like, uh, well, I kind of think of Russians as being European. So um, it is interesting the fact that at least if you were just going off this uh, movie, the impression is that that's not really how they see themselves. Um, so, so yeah, uh, what, what, what has been your experience living in Russia for a while and traveling and seeing quite a lot of different people and places? And, and of course, it's not necessarily going to come up all the time, but is this something you've encountered? Uh, Russians considering themselves as like a separate culture from, from Europe. I was going to say the rest of Europe, but you know, seeing themselves as separate completely. Well, what's interesting to me is the fact that different Russians sort of feel different identities, right? Mm. So if you're in, let's say you're in St. Petersburg, or maybe even in Kaliningrad, because it's actually, you know, it's so, it's so European. But if you're in St. Petersburg, a lot of people there do consider themselves to be European. They talk mm. about it being like the European capital of Russia or something like that. Yeah. And I feel like in Moscow, lots of people 
find themselves into sort of a, probably more European than anything else. But then when you go to the Far East, of course, you can go to Habarovsk and Vladivostok. They have a strange identity because they're deep in Asia. Mm. But the uh, architecture, the uh, influence from the capital city, it's so European. But there are lots of people who sort of feel stuck between not necessarily Asia and and Europe, but like you said, like something different. But I think on the whole, when I would speak to people in Moscow mm. or in St. Petersburg, I think they would consider themselves European. And, and if we think about this movie itself, it's a, it is a very European movie. Mm. We consider it's about monarchy, right? That's, uh, this European style monarchy, it's, that's, that's definitely something that comes from from Europe. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's something that's really brought to the brought to the fore in probably one of the most impressive sequences is when we have the Persian ambassador coming mm. to visit Tsar Nicholas the First because Nicholas the First and the other Russian monarchs that we see they look pretty similar to in terms of their dress to the way that people from just any European contemporary monarchy would look. You just kind of change the colours around and, you know, the emblems and you're pretty much you're pretty much there. But the Persians, they look very, very different. So I just don't really know anything at all about that period of Iranian history. So it was it was really interesting seeing those those costumes from, from that time period. I thought that was a really cool sequence yeah that's 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 one of the real juxtapositions in, in the movie right i heard an interview with the director and he was talking about how this movie is sort of about the meeting of europe and and russia mm. and how russia has always been fascinated by europe sure but europe's always been a little cold or, or maybe even ambivalent ambivalent towards russia Mm. Um, and the director, in the interview that I was watching with him, he seemed to sort of re- regret it. Like he, mm. Mm. it was something he was he was quite sad about. Um, but I don't know. I think that sort of comes across in the movie as as well, right? Where uh, obviously this guy who's from France and this pe- these people are from Russia. They they are they're more similar than different, aren't they? But the French guy, the the stranger, the European, seems to sort of is looking at them kind of like a zoo, you know. Like, oh uh, yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, he's he's quite a disagreeable traveling companion. He's so grumpy and so dismissive and so so arrogant. You just kind of like you just want to give him a little bit of a shake and like just knock it off, okay? We've <laughs> uh, we've got another you know seventy minutes to hang around with you can you please be a little bit more pleasant <laughs> yeah I, I found i found the same as well he wasn't he didn't endear himself uh to the to the viewer does he like, uh... not at all um yeah. i just wanted to kind of crowbar this in as a as a little bit of uh, of trivia go, go for it so the actor who plays the stranger is sergey dryden who yes. um I don't think he's got a hugely long filmography, but we've actually covered another of his films on, on the podcast. Um, have you by any chance seen Window to Paris? I haven't seen it, uh, but I do know he's in it. And I knew he's, he's actually credited in that movie in a different name as well. Yeah, so. I think so. Yeah, but it's it's I, I forget what he is what he's what he's called in that one. But it's I, like a different I, surname, I think. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It is. I double checked, and it is it's the. It is the same the same, the same guy, job. but mm. um, I thought it was you know it was obviously interesting seeing him you know in a role from well over ten years later. But also that that movie very much kind of the clue is in the title. It's kind of like Russia looking at Europe and Europe looking back, and the two kind of going, "I don't really get what you're about. You're kind of weird." And then, but you know, and that being very much like a mutual feeling. So I thought that was a kind of a weird, interesting. Uh, it's like a um, parallel there, isn't parallel, it? Parallel, really? yeah. So I, I don't know how much of that kind of Sergei Dryden kind of like. I don't know how involved he was in 
like talking about how the performance was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Again, we're kind of jumping back and forwards in time, which I think is kind of apt given given the 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 movie uh, and sort of jumping yes. around in our discussion. But uh, I, I would really like to see more about how this thing was made because it feels improvised in the sense of it just feels like you're wandering around, as I think we've both said. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there's such spectacular kind of set pieces that you encounter that it's clearly not improvised because that wouldn't work. But it's just weird that it manages to have this feel of just some stuff that's happening around you. Well, well, Alistair, you're in luck. Okay. <laughs> there's, a there's, a there's a really great documentary on, on YouTube about the making of this movie. Mm. And it follows it from just prior to when they start filming uh, and all the way through the first take, which failed, and the second take, which failed. And it shows how they... Um, really interesting. It, it is, it's sort of semi-improvised, but that's only mm. because there's so much... There's so many people. The test is so large that they couldn't possibly practice, didn't have the spaces to practice. And w one thing I saw in this documentary is they had they had one day in the museum and only four hours which they could shoot it within because the museum's oh not going to close forever. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. pressure. <laughs> so it had like one. They had one day basically, and only four hours of the daylight, which was enough to film the the, the mm. movie that they wanted to. So. What they showed in this documentary, the the making of the movie, is that the lots of the the actors and the director and even the cameraman who must have been so tired. Oh my came in goodness! At, yeah, <laughs> came in at came in. He came in at three a.m. to practice. They all came in at three a.m. Mm. and they walked through it because it was the first time, like in the rooms, they'd, they'd practice the sort of movements a little bit, but not in natural spaces. So really, they although it, I guess it was semi uh, improvised with with like sort of guidelines that they'd practiced over time, mm. but really you have to, you'd have to rehearse that so many times to, for it really to be without improvisation at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's incredible, but that but that kind of like semi improvised nature of it is probably why it does feel like strangely like non-fiction you know it kind of feels like a fantastical documentary almost yeah there was a, a really cool thing revealed in the making of movie mm. uh, the making of documentary about it so there's a scene in the in the in the movie the the real movie where the actor gets very close to some fine china do you remember this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the and the guys are, um, who are like the the wait staff are like, no, leave it alone. Yes, yeah, like get away from get away from the China. They were actually real Hermitage security guards in period <laughs> costume oh, who wow. were there to protect Catherine the Great's actual China. Right. Yeah. You you don't want to be the guy who accidentally knocks that on the floor. <laughs> they basically said this actor can come this close, but nobody else can. Mm. Like the cameraman can come so close, the main guy can come so close, and everybody else stay well away. Mm. And he gets really close, and he looks at it, and all of this kind of thing. And then like, get away, get away, get away. And that was <laughs> fully that that wasn't re that wasn't rehearsed. Mm. That's just them going like, uh, this is the yeah. expensive stuff. Leave it alone." Uh, well, see, I have a little bit of I have a bit of trivia for you as well. Sure. How about it? The the guy who the stranger the European is is uh, based on, he hmm. actually came from a family of china makers. Oh, okay. So he had like oh. a kind of personal slash professional interest. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting that he gets so close to the China and like inspecting it and this. Um, maybe the actor if he's so good he kind of knew these things and thought oh, that would be a nice thing to do i i don't know it's a speculation but interesting fact sure yeah yeah that that is an interesting extra kind of layer of uh, uh of glaze on the uh, mm -hmm. on the character on the uh, yeah, if exactly. yeah yeah um oh, where do we go from there um let's speak about the um uh the camera the some technical things, maybe. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have, I have something like maybe like, is it a gimmick kind of thing? You know. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Because that is that is definitely a very valid question to ask. Like, is this just right. like a good 
movie or is this just a really impressive like technical kind of almost like athletic feat but like nothing mm-hmm. more yeah wh- where would you come down on that well it's interesting because there's uh, for example if we're talking about af- like an athletic feat you know mm. that there's a 10 minute dancing scene yes uh, where there's so many um people in that room and the cameraman's constantly moving he's orbiting this is one hour into the movie as well, so he's already been yeah. carrying this super heavy camera. And this is an and hour. this is go number three. I mean, I don't know how far they got into yeah. takes one and two, but still, yeah, this is like yeah. two plus hours on his feet. Yeah, yeah, and he's orbiting around this room for ten minutes, basically. I, just, I have no idea. I have no idea how how he did it. It was the bit of the film which was the most impressive. Yeah, um, definitely. I do think it was may- maybe the, also the worst scene because it went on for way too long. <laughs> I don't know. I I just found found that kind of pretty enchanting. I think at the, I think at that point the movie had kind of sucked me in because the first kind of ten minutes or so it's quite a lot. Like it feels almost like you're watching like a, an orchestra kind of like tuning up. It's it's a mm. lot of kind of like meandering around and you're quite close in to people and you can't really necessarily see a whole lot and you're kind of going through corridors and it's quite dark and gloomy and then just towards the end of the movie it's kind of like it hits you with these set pieces in the in the larger halls and uh, and actually because I watched it in two sittings this uh, the second sitting I kind of was much closer into the screen and I had my headphones in and I was kind of like this is really impressive, impressive stuff. Yeah. So, um, and then of course we have the the orchestra itself at the end, and you have a live performance, and you're kind of in amongst right. the, the instruments as well, and it's just like this is really impressive. Um, yes, it's incredibly impressive, and that's why I think it's it's not a gimmick, and I don't think the movie could exist in a world where it's filmed with cuts. Uh, you wouldn't feel like you're floating. And I don't think the movie is that great outside of the way it was made. The mm. spectacular shots, the spectacular like scenery, if it was a cut and then they cut somewhere else and then you saw this fantastic dance, it would be, yeah, it's, it would be great, but it just wouldn't feel the same, would it? You know? Definitely, I totally agree. It would, it would feel even more like a sequence of stuff like because mm-hmm. it's not really a narrative it's kind of stuff drifting in and out the fact that it's all happening in sequence without any looking away that kind of creates this kind of dreamlike you know mysterious yeah. atmosphere and if you were just kind of like oh and now we're jumping over here to this other thing it would wouldn't create that effect in in the same way so yeah i'm i'm to- i'm totally with you it it sounds like it's it's just a gimmick, but I think it's it's kind of an inspired idea. Yeah, and I, what I found watching this movie is it's it's not often you watch a film. Actually, maybe 1917 uh, is including this. Mm. It's not often you watch a film and you're feeling how the movie was made while you're watching it. Mm. Especially the first watch. So you might go back and think, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. Um, but in this, you, you really do feel sort of in every moment how it was made. And it's quite a, um, it's quite a unique feeling, really. It sort of feels mm. like you're in some sort of immersive theatre, like in the round kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it, it's, it's odd because that makes it seem like, it, like it's quite artificial. But like I, I keep saying... I I kept feeling like this is real stuff that's that's happening, even though I know it's not. It's just something about it, the kind of like the continuousness and the, as we've already said, the semi-improvised na- nature of things. It just it just feels less kind of like mannered and artificial than like a a sort of conventional fictional film you know that's not to say that Mm -hmm. you know normal (laughs) more normal like narrative cinema isn't enjoyable this just feels quite separate um i was gonna say about the atmosphere um Mm -hmm. because i've I've read in a few places sakurov being 
compared to Tarkovsky or being described as like the heir of Tarkovsky. And I think like obviously he mostly was did kind of like at least like loosely there was a story to to his films, but this felt quite close in terms of like the atmosphere and pacing and the yeah. Yeah, um, which which uh, Tarkovsky movies come to mind? Probably in terms of mood, probably Stalker in a weird way. Although obviously, mm-hmm. you, you know, you couldn't get much more different in terms of like the physical setting. But there's there's something about the the mood and the atmosphere uh, that that seems quite similar. And obviously, that that has lots of extended takes. So that's that's probably where that comparison is 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 coming from. Yeah, it's for interesting. Me. It's interesting. Yeah. So uh, one thing we haven't talked about very much was that obviously this is it's a it's an art gallery now. I wasn't particularly struck by that much of the art that they looked at, which makes me feel like I'm a bit of a philistine. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know about I don't know about you. How did how how did you feel about the 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 paintings that we see? Well, I'm sort of maybe influenced by my my visits there, mm. and one thing you do not I'm not necessarily talking about the movie, but one thing that happens when you go into the Hermitage, you actually like you actually look at the the roof and the walls, the ceilings more than the paintings, more than the art. I, I found that in in real life. Mm, that's interesting. I think it's like sort of if you visited Buckingham Palace mm. and you'd see a painting on the wall, you'd say, oh, that's a nice painting. But really you're looking at like the way it's all decorated everywhere. Mm. See, this is this is the thing. This Watching this movie made me feel really bad because I recall very, very little about my visit to the Hermitage. I kind of like, I remember that I enjoyed it. I mean, I did my usual thing of getting like museum back after about two and a half hours and being like oh, okay that's enough for one day but because i i only went that once and i did a lot of things in the kind of couple of days i was i was in st petersburg but that wasn't the experience that stuck with me whereas because i lived in moscow i went to the trechikov multiple times and i got a bit more of a feel for it and you know i kind of semi learnt the layout and this is where this painting is and ah oh, this is this is this painting that I've seen kind of multiple times and gone home and looked up and found more information about it yeah it was a very much like kind of I really want to go back now and kind of like appreciate it properly <laughs> I guess um, no I, but I I think you're not I think you've done nothing wrong I think when if you talk about uh Hermitage, it's like um, it's more a palace than an art museum, mm. in my opinion. Uh, whereas, like uh, Tverchikov Gallery in Moscow, it's an art gallery. Mm. And and with it being the current and probably for the foreseeable future <laughs> uh, Russian capital, that's kind of where the absolutely like Russian art, the the kind of like the this is this is what our artists paint about those paintings are there in the Tretikov, whereas I get the impression that the the Hermitage collection is is a bit more kind of international and less Russia orientated. I don't know. That's kind of that's just my impression, but um, there's definitely a, a lot more that I remember about the Tretikov, and like if I could choose one or the other to visit you know just as an art gallery rather than a as a space uh, I, I would definitely say you know go to the Tretikov first but obviously if you are in St Petersburg you should definitely go and and this makes me want to go back and, and appreciate it more as a you know incredibly beautiful space and this this film really does a great job of of appreciating those uh those incredibly impressive uh rooms and corridors and yeah i think we talk about the characters being the stranger the director behind the camera um the people all around you but in really the main character is it's the building isn't it it's the museum actually mm, yeah uh, yeah that's it's it's that's one of the only things that's constantly there when the, the scenery is changing uh the time is changing like mm. the, as in like 
the time period is changing. But one thing that's there is that uh, that that palace, which has mm. looked the same for so long. Yeah, I, in terms of the changes in the different times, a, a comment I read in Birgit Boimer's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, book, um, Rush, uh, History of Russian Cinema, uh, one of her observations was that the film doesn't really spend very much time on the Soviet period at all. It's almost completely absent. And I thought that's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, almost like, it's just kind of like blocking that out and like, let's not talk about that. Um, although there is one notable exception. Um, there's one bit where they go into a room where there's lots of like frames leaning against the wall and there's kind of like a, a guy moving them about. And I don't remember whether it's the, you know, the first person narrator or whether it's the character in the room set, but one of them says, no, no, we can't go in here. We can't stay. There there are corpses, there are bodies. And it's And it's kind of like... It takes a really sinister tone, and uh, at this point, I was I was watching with with Carrie, and and she was pretty convinced that it, that's um, an allusion to the siege of Leningrad in World War Two. Which you know, if you don't know that bit of Russian history, it was you know pretty much hell on earth because of the the the, the blockade and the lack of food in the city, and I forget whether it was a million people who died or or more than that but it was it was just absolutely horrific and and I thought that was interesting that the film seemed to allude to that but generally doesn't talk much about the Soviet period it, it, you know even though that's obviously like a big chunk of time between the present the then present day that the movie was made and most of what we observe so I think it's more than an illusion. I think it's pretty clear that it's during the the siege of Leningrad. I think um, mm, there's no okay. other time period really where it could possibly be. Mm, and there's, there's, there's also a, a bit um, where they're talking about, uh, it's like the director of the museum and he's like whispering about mm. making repairs to the palace. Mm. Do you yeah. remember this? It was, it, was Vague, it was a short. It was vaguely, it was a short. vaguely, yeah. And that's supposed to be during the time of Stalin. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, but you're right. The Soviet period is very short in this movie. It's really, mm. it's a, it's really a movie about the Romanov era. Yeah, and a, li- a little bit of the Soviet thing, and yes. then a bit of a tiny little bit of modern day, isn't it? Actually, yeah, yeah yes, yeah. Because we did mention that you briefly have like a museum director talking with somebody, some kind of important official or, or something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it being a short period of history, of, of Russian history, but St. Petersburg only has a short history, of right? Of course, it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was built, um, it was built by Peter the Great. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't really do this movie and have people like Ivan the Terrible because it would be like, well, why is he there? <laughs> There's nothing here. So... Uh, yeah, um, gee, just wanted to crowbar a couple of other, um, one obviously incredibly important figure, and then one more minor figure, uh, that we encounter in, in the movie. We, we get, uh, a couple of brief glimpses of Pushkin. Right, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> and, and both times he seems to be, you know, speaking of conflict, uh, having... A, a bit of a row with with his wife, and um, yeah, I thought that was kind of a, a an interesting detail that we don't have him doing something like grand and poetic. We don't do it, have him doing the thing that he's remembered for. We have him just having a bit of an argument. And again, long time listeners, if you've caught our Anyegin episode, we've, we've talked about this before. But uh, but Pushkin. He had a bit of a temper, like, he, I think it was something like his 27th or his 28th duel um, that he was finally mortally wounded in, so, you know, that guy was really living on borrowed time, but, yeah. Well, you know, he, the, the final duel happened because someone tried to seduce his wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, and that was the thing, he was quite jealous, and certainly the, that was the, the era where it wasn't that unusual that you solved quote-unquote slights to your honor by you know meeting the guy outside 
somewhere. Although it was it was pointed out to me that that part of that was people didn't feel like they could trust the Tsar to be like an impartial adjudicator. And so at least by having a duel, you were kind of like sorting it out your, yourselves and it, it was kind of like fairer for fate to decide than for the Tsar to decide based on who he liked more. Um, but that's that could be totally conjecture. Well, I thought it was an interesting idea. What's, what's interesting about it is actually it seemed to flow through this dueling thing happened mm. to Russian writers and poets. Oh, of course. Yeah, because, of course, <laughs> Anyegin is somewhat uh, autobiographical, you know, because the, the duel is, like, the pivotal point in the plot of 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 that story and there's in a, a very important duel in 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 war and peace um i think at least one and there's certainly talk that there might be others but i think there's only actually one but it's um yeah uh can you think of any other instances sorry putting you on the spot but i mean I'm, i can talk from actually real life writers real life oh, poets. okay yeah uh when alexander pushkin died in 1837 i think in a duel following his death the most prominent uh poet was lermontov and mm. only four years after uh pushkin died in a duel lermontov died in a duel and lermontov was only 26 when he died as well so it seemed mm. to be like a thing of like poets or writers, I don't know, some sort of creative, passionate thing that they end up sorting out their their battles by shooting each other. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that wasn't something that was particularly unique to, to Russia. It was just kind of a, you know, because you get uh, talk of, even in Jane Austen, for goodness sake, you, get, you have talk of there possibly being being a duel between two uh, two characters it never actually happens but uh, that was definitely something that was in the culture and in the literature and something that you know occasionally people did it's kind of like kind of kind of baffling now but i mean i'm sure you know the uh, the hit musical hamilton of and course he, yeah alexander he... hamilton died by being shot by vice president Aaron burr right yeah of course so uh, so yeah definitely uh not even the Europeans having a monopoly on uh, on sorting sorting things <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, in kind of quite a messy messy fashion. I, I I've not managed to get along to see Hamilton, but it's definitely very much on the things I want to do. Hopefully, before too long. But uh, I, I've even avoided uh, avoided the music just because I kind of like I want to see it for the first time and it to be like all new but uh but there you go um yes and the other figure that i wanted to crowbar in less famous and like probably less important than, well certainly le less important than pushkin because pushkin's kind of like as i've probably mentioned lots of times on the podcast basically shakespeare that's his that's his position in in russian literature he is to russian literature what shakespeare is to english but um yeah so we have a mention of uh, Gribayedov in the Persian ambassador scene because the reason the Persians are there is that they're there to apologize for the fact that this group of Russian diplomats in the capital have been killed by a mob and you have this statement by the Persian ambassador and then it's translated into Russian and and yeah the narrator uh, i think it's the narrator or possibly it's the it's it's the stranger mentions that uh, that one of the one of the people who'd been killed was Gribayedov who is this um you know fairly important russian writer who uh, i i don't know i don't know whether on in your courses you ever read Gordia at Umar or the english title woe from wit i haven't but uh, i i kind of the title always kind of amuses me um, yeah, no, I haven't, but I, I know a little bit about him as like hmm. he was the Russian ambassador to Iran, um, which is a in, pretty, very interesting thing to do in the mm. early 19th century. Hmm. And the interesting thing is, um, it's it's with this being in St. Petersburg, and we know how Pushkin is inextricably linked to St. Petersburg hmm. um, because of uh, there's 
Saskia Salo is like the school that, that's there and everything that he attended. But there's also, if you talk about Gribayedov, the one of the main canals in the center of St. Petersburg is named after him. Mm, okay. So we have yeah, it's the, it's the one that go. If I'm if I'm right, it's the one that goes past the internationally famous church on spilled blood. So oh, seems... okay, I haven't realised that. Yeah, so um, yeah. for again for listeners maybe like less familiar with with Russian history, the church on the spilled blood it looks very kind of St Basil's esque in terms <laughs> of like having the onion domes and the all the colours and kind of ornate. Nurse, but it was it's actually exactly built... what you'd expect a Russian church to look like. Yes, like stereotypical. Yes, yes, it's kind of almost like a stereotypical Russian church, only more so. But mm-hmm. at that point in Russian history, that kind of thing was was way out of fashion. Generally speaking, the churches looked a lot more kind of like I, I guess like neoclassical and domes and and columns. But yeah, this one was was made. And as the name suggests, it's on the spill blood. But the, uh, whose blood it was, was Alexander II, who was the Tsar who was assassinated. And I want to say, what, 1880, I think? Maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of like a a, a little detail. No, I hadn't realised that that was uh, the Gribyedov uh, Yeah, and Gribi- I mean, Gribyedov actually from um, Moscow. Oh, OK. Um as far as far as I'm aware, and mm. I know he has a, a statue in Moscow too. It's uh, mm. in the area Chistiaprudi, Clean Ponds. Yeah. When you get out of the metro and you walk towards that, there's lakes. Very nice area, especially in uh, summer. Oh there's a yeah. Big statue which greets you outside the me- outside the metro, and it's him. Okay, right. That's yeah. who that guy is. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, now you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, his his main his main book that I've just mentioned, Woe from Wit. I don't know very much about it other than I think like the book's central premise is that the problem with being smart is that you're just aware of what a terrible place the the world is and and how in some ways actually being less intelligent um uh, it's kind of like the whole you know ignorance is bliss kind of thing so just based on that, I almost think of him as being like the spiritual forefather of, of Lisa Simpson. I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, yeah, I don't know whether you're a Simpsons fan, but uh, I guess I'm just of that no, age. I, I was <laughs> I was at one point. I definitely was. Oh, uh, yeah. There's just this one episode which kind of focuses on, on how Lisa is miserable because <laughs> she's smart and everyone around her and everyone in the, her family, particularly the men, are so stupid. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I think that's probably about as big a stretch as you can get from Griber Yedov to uh, to Lisa Simpson. So, yeah, that's kind of a, like a a bit of an inauspicious note to kind of end <laughs> end the podcast on. But uh, did you enjoy watching this for a second time? And would you recommend it generally to other people? Watching it the second time, I did enjoy it. I actually think I enjoyed it more than I watched when I watched it the first time. Oh great! Um, when I watched the because when I watched the first time, I I didn't really know what to expect. Mm. Um, so I sort of felt like, where's the plot? Almost. Mm. I watched it the second time. I was watching it through more of a uh, a film a film fan sort of that mm. eyes, like the way it was filmed and everything. And I, I, I really quite enjoyed it. And I would recommend this movie to people who are interested in Russian history or filmmaking. Mm. I think if you're not interested in either of those two, this might be a struggle. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it could definitely be a bit of a chore. Yeah, so if you're a film fan, yeah. Awesome. I think the the other thing I would I would say is perhaps if this was ever playing at a cinema near you, it would be one worth seeing. Just being able to see it with a live audience and with a surround sound and a giant screen, I can imagine that being even more immersive. So that would be the other thing I would say about like whether this is worth watching is is if it happens to be playing near you. Yeah, I feel like watching it just on my computer with my headphones in, I sort of felt like, I said before, almost a, a bit of theatre in the round, you know, mm. you're, you're in the middle of this thing that's happening around you. I can. I only feel like with a big screen, it could be even more immersive. Mm. Like great speakers as well, you know. Yeah, I definitely feel like once I put my headphones in for like the last 
for the second half, it definitely improved my experience just getting that closer in. Um, but yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Johnny, for coming and like sharing your experience of this film and your knowledge of Russia and Russian history. Um, if folks would like to hear more from you and your like travels and your experience of being in Russia, where would they go to find you? Well, I'm on every social network, all in the same username, Johnny Tickle, just my name, very creative. Uh, my main thing is really YouTube. I've been sort of slacking at the start of this year, but it's picking up now. I'm <laughs> traveling a lot more. <laughs> now um, that it's a little bit nicer to be outside, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I, was, I didn't really want to leave the house in, in winter. But also, I think the best place to uh, get in contact with me would probably be on Twitter. It's probably where I spend the most time. But yeah, if you're interested in maybe some of my content, then YouTube's the place to go. And it's Johnny Tickle, easy. Awesome. And yeah, I would definitely encourage people to uh, to check those out. Yeah, and uh, lots of long, continuous takes uh, walking around the, the streets of various Russian cities. It's, it's really it's re a real treat. All right, well, thank you for joining us, Johnny. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been, a, been an absolute pleasure. All right, well, until next time, das Vidania, folks. Das Vidania. So that's it for this episode, but before I go, I'd like to thank Sasha Ilukovic and the Highly Skilled Migrants for the use of their song Cold in our intro. You can find that song and the rest of their back catalogue on Bandcamp and Spotify. If you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting us by leaving a rating at Apple Podcasts or at podchaser.com. That second one, Podchaser, even lets you rate individual episodes, so if this episode particularly stood out to you, you can let other listeners know that you enjoyed it. Recommending the show on social media is hugely helpful as well. If you can spare a moment or two to do that, it would really make my day. Thank you, thank you very much. Speaking of social media... Please find us and say hi on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. You can also drop us a line at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, take care of yourselves, and bye for now. Okay. <laughs> I'll, set, I'll set up sentence again. <laughs> there's, there's kind of an, a, an irony of us not doing this in a single continuous take, isn't there? <laughs> yes, there is indeed, yeah. Okay, so a quick announcement before you move on to whatever is next on your podcast playlist. The Rarus Files Unite movie podcast now has an online bookshop, which means that any book that you pick up from there using the affiliate link in the show notes, we get a 10% commission, which will go to covering the costs of running the show. So, I suppose you're wondering what you might find in the bookshop. Well, as you might imagine, it's all like Russia and Russian film themed. But one example, which ties in with the episode you just listened to, is Alexander Sokorov, Russian Ark by Birgit Boimers. We've got some classic Russian literature in there. We've got books on Russian history. We've got some resources for learning Russian, if that's something you're interested in doing. So yeah, basically click on the link in the show notes and have a browse and see if there's anything that you think you might like. For the time being, the bookstore is available to listeners in the UK only, but if you're listening from elsewhere, it's still perhaps worth having a browse because you'll almost certainly be able to pick up any of those titles from your local independent bookstore or wherever you get your books. Thank you for listening to this small announcement and enjoy whatever you are listening to next. Bye-bye!